Okay. And um, let me just, I'll just give you a, a, a very brief introduction and you can feel free to fill in the, in the blanks. I'm just going to share with the class. So I see here is Chris, Abigail, Ta, Anthony, Matthew, Callie, Kyle, and Pavitra. Welcome. And a big, huge, hearty welcome to Shaima for joining us this afternoon. I see Victor. Victor has just joined us as well. Welcome, Victor. So just a little bit of um, background. So I I know uh, Shaima uh, secondarily through an organization that I sometimes work for called Culture All. That's here in uh, in our area in Des Moines, and on several occasions I've been uh, went into the into the elementary schools to offer Japanese calligraphy, um, and I, in the past I have uh, sh led students to the to the mosque to the masjid here in Ames. Uh, we've we've spent several classes uh, in different different semesters at the at the masjid in Ames, and it was just such a a wonderful experience. Um, however, uh, the one thing I found out was um, it, it was great to be in a, inside of a, of a mosque and hear directly from the imam speak, and um, I really like I really like him. Uh, however, I wanted to hear a, a female voice from uh, the Muslim community. And so I reached out to Culture All because they, this, the organization works with folks from various ethnicities here in our local area. And they provided me with uh, Shaima's uh, contact info. And last semester, Shaima gave us a wonderful talk. And, uh, and so I invited her, her back this, this semester. So Shaima also, she has, um, I just been listening to your podcast. Um, randomly selected for random search and i'm just it's it just fantastic if you guys have a chance i've 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 shared the link with you with the class for um this podcast and it's just really really great for busting myths about not just about islam and, and um, muslim community but also just stereotypes uh, regarding uh, uh, Black Lives Matters and, and, and other things as well. So it doesn't just focus on religion, but mainly what I could see is um, trying to turn around the way that we, we uh, unconsciously think or believe about differences, diversities, things that make us feel fear, um, those kinds of things. Um, so I just, the um, intro for randomly selected for random search says uh, about Shaima that she is about to break any misperceptions you may have visit amplified for from okay um Shaima Ali was raised in Egypt grew up in a private Catholic school and earned her BA in economics and statistics Shaima moved to the U.S. in the early 2000s and earned her MBA in executive development from Drake University in Iowa Okay, um, and just great, great uh, titles for these uh, these podcasts that have been that have been published. So one of the most recent one being about an attorney who had to choose between um, working for the Black Lives Matters movement and uh, working for a big company and the the process he went through and changing that. Anyways, I'm not going to go into details about those things, but just it's they're wonderful uh, podcasts there. And some of you have asked about the hijab and why why Muslim women wear it. She has a podcast out specifically about that. So if you want to check that out, but um, I want to turn it over to to you, Shaima, and um, take the floor. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for having me. It's always a pleasure. I love having your emails uh, because it's not work related and not podcast trouble related. No. Uh, 
as in and I, you're giving me a lot of credit and i'm i'm just a regular ordinary person as far as i call myself i'm just gonna set the ground and set the floor here i'm only speaking for shaima shaima ali my experiences i don't represent all the muslim women i don't represent all women from the middle east and i don't represent all muslim community here in des moines iowa I am far from an Islamic scholar, uh, so I'm I'm not the expert. Uh, I'm a practicing Muslim, which means I I go I attend my prayers when possible. I pray my five times a day, and I observe Ramadan, which means I fast during the month of Ramadan. I pay my charity, um, so that's I'm, I consider myself a, a practicing Muslim, and I would say. 85% practicing Muslim because sometimes like things happen. I'm not, I'm far from perfect. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I received the questions. So I'm all yours. I can look at the questions and go through them and I can just shut up and just open the floor for anything. I'm just gonna say nothing will offend me at all. I, I, my daily life could include a middle finger while I'm driving. Uh, so it's just like nothing. <laughs> will offend me. Nothing is personal. Nothing will offend me. So I'm all yours. Yeah, yeah. And um, also, I just want to call the students attention to the chat box. So if you're um, if you want to ask a question, you have the option either to turn off your mic or turn on your mic and speak it or to go directly to the chat box and do it that way. If you feel more comfortable just writing it in. But um, we could start. I would love for you to share. Um, well, first of all, maybe the questions that the students offered, perhaps going into one of them that you thought was most pertinent for for this moment. Um, I will tell you the first one stood uh, out to me because if you if I take it for face value uh, and it's literally said. Um, in the past, I have taken students to the masjid during prayer time. It was wonderful to hear prayer and step inside the mosque. If you were to associate around sounds or images with Islam, what would they be for you? And that question is, I'm just, if I'm going to answer it for, for the face value, it's going to be the sound of Islam is usually the Quran or, 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 or the or they call for the prayer, and that's the one. And then the that's the simple piece. The images of Islam is just again. If I'm gonna look at the face value, I'm gonna tell you something like the the Quran or an image of the Quran. But I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper about the images of Islam and what's the controversy around uh, all the backlash and the drama in the media when um, things happen in France about someone right posting a cartoon of Prophet Muhammad and what's all the back heat about the images of Islam. So I'm just gonna jump into that uh, piece that's a little bit more into the question. So um, in case you're not familiar, there is like a lot of articles, a lot of incidents that happen when um, journalists were attacked or, um, and actually even more than that, uh, a building in France or a news newspaper building was uh, bombed because they posted multiple times a cartoon, humiliating cartoon images of the prophet. I'm not justifying, again, and I don't need to command, uh, to, co to condemn any of these behavior because it's a, any act of violence, there is no need for any certain human being of any religion to go and say, I'm against this. It's like, like, I think it's just another topic for another day, but uh, I don't, of course, support that. The thing is, why this trigger people and why this trigger um, extremists and not only trigger them, but why actually of could offend a regular Muslim just like me or a basic Muslim? It just images in Islam. It's something that I would say, I'm not going to say prohibited uh, because it's not stated in the scripture of the Quran. I'm going to say it's something that's not really recommended by the scholars of Islam. And that's because of the fear that once you start associating a religion with an image that people will shift their prayer towards the image and that will go back to the days where people were uh, praying or worshiping um, 
sculptures or images or uh, monuments or stuff like that. So that that's why pe like the scholar majority, if not all the scholars of Islam agreed that we should refrain from drawing images to um, to the prophet or or to God. And you can notice it sometimes that that's one of the um, the, the the differences between Islam and, and Christianity, for example, or um, Judaism is we don't have a picture of Jesus or sorry of Muhammad just like a picture of Jesus in, in when you go to a Catholic uh, churches and people start praying there or bending because the prayers the bending should be directed to God and there should not be a metal image or a metal person or a metal anything in between the prayers and and um and your face should be directed to directly to God. So that's that's on that question. And I'm going to pause here. Any feedback, thoughts, comments? Hmm. I, I just love that response. I, I, I have some thoughts in there. Um, so that was my question. And, and um, I just remember going to the masjid in Washington, D.C. Uh, this was maybe 25 years ago or, or, or earlier with my father because I was taking a class on Islam in college and my father uh, encouraged us. He said, well, we're right here. We can go to D.C. And, and visit the mosque. And my impression in going inside the mosque was it was like geometry. So those are the images that came to my mind, geometry. And um, and I was just showing my son this morning. We were out for a walk and we where he loves to watch cars go by. We were standing near an oak tree and there were all of these acorns on the ground. And I picked up the, um, you know, the top of the acorn, you can whistle into them and stuff. But if you look at the design on the, on the top of the acorn, what do you see? It's geometry, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so I, I just, I am so taken. I'm not, I, I love the fact that um, there is this, the representation, if you can call it that, or images that, if you can call them images, uh, correlate with math in some way. <laughs> you know, so. You're hundred percent right. And that's because of my, um, um, I don't want to, uh, push anyone's bottom regarding their feelings towards algebra and geometry, but most of it was, uh, invented and developed by Muslim and Arab, um, hmm. Um, what they call them, scholars. Uh, so, and that's why you can see it in the art. I would not consider that really an image. That's that's more of an Islamic art. And if you dig into the Islamic art, it will focus around two things. It's these shapes that you you mentioned. It's all geometry shapes that histagon, pentagon, um, and it's really colored. And then other um, art things that you can um, see is using the Arabic language calligraphy when we write in Arabic, but that's not how, like, this is not how I write. This is really an art using that, that the writing and it make it looks really good. So these are the two types of Islamic art that comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then I, I really appreciate also this idea of, of uh, what you brought out there about um, this Muslims don't go to Muhammad in the same way that, say, Christians go to Jesus and have that middle person there is not getting us directly to Allah. So that I think that's a really uh, big big uh, shift for a lot of us, especially if we're if we associate ch going to church with certain images. And you were you went to the Catholic Church, this loaded with images. I was brought up Catholic, so I'm, I'm familiar with the the images in the Catholic Church and the Virgin Mary and, uh, you know, the crucifixes and uh, all of the stained glass and all of that. So it I mean, it must be like such a so for you, it must have been like where am I when you went into these churches? Um, but I think me and us, we really, if we're not Muslim, if we grew up in a, in a church atmosphere that uh, has all of these images around us, it must be very disorienting to then go into a space that's, that is holy, that is sacred, and, and all of these images not there. 
Although I will say that there are some uh, Christian churches that don't have any images, like for example, the, the Quakers, they don't have any images in their, in their uh, spaces of worship, but that's, um, and, and there are other, there are others, maybe some of you, some of you guys, um, some of the students have some experience of that, I'm not sure, but anyways, this idea of image, and um, one of the things like, wh why I asked about images in, in particular is that uh, when we, you know, in the, in the, for example, in the Hindu tradition, Hindus recognize that it's impossible to not have an image of God. And so instead of, instead of having one image, they have a thousand images because, mm -hmm. God, because God can't be captured in the image. And I feel like you're saying the same thing, right? Um, but yeah. one tradition is, is just going overboard with the images and the other tradition is just saying no images. And, yeah. uh, and in Judaism too, well, it's, I, I can't, you know, again, I don't want to speak as a, I'm not a scholar of religion either. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a practitioner of Buddhism. And, um, and so we have, I have a, a kind of a strange relationship with, with images uh, as well. In some cases, I feel that they can bring me closer to what you want to call the divine or whatever. In other cases, it might be an obstacle to that. Um, yeah, but I, I feel like this this sense of uh, for for Islam in particular the importance of not representing particularly like Muhammad Prophet Muhammad in an image. I think we should know that like because if you go to you go to um, the internet and look for images of Prophet Muhammad, you'll find them, and people think that oh because they're on the internet they must be legit, and I thought that until I, I saw a, um, a YouTube video of um, a, a, a descri of a um, biography of Prophet Muhammad. It was kind of like this cartoon type thing. And I liked it because there, well, it drew me my attention because the head of Prophet Muhammad was all light. And so it didn't show his image. I was like, what, what's going on? Why is that? It kind of really, it kind of took me aback by surprise and then i was oh because prophet muhammad shouldn't be put in an image and yet people do it mm -hmm. yeah and and again the whole logic around it is like people connect to images right mm. and um and and to defear people from profiting from praying or worshiping a prophet it, that's why most of the scholars recommended not to draw the prophet because the prophet in so many times he said that he's just a basic normal human being that he himself had his own sense right and and that's something the scholars in islam continue to take on is avoid that because the prophet most of the time he reinforces the message i am just a human being and and i have my own sense i have my own flaws and no one is perfect Beautiful, beautiful. I and that's a um, in the in the Buddhist tradition. I'm not sure you know this, but uh, for the first several centuries of Buddhism, after the Buddha's death, it was forbidden to actually create an image of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, and then they started cropping up as as a result of several things one being the inter interaction between greek culture and um indian culture then you start seeing the the first image of the buddha was actually of his feet the bottoms of his feet and um i uh, uh but also i say this because the buddha also during his lifetime said don't make images of me don't turn me into a god i'm just a human being mm -hmm. yeah and another thing that is not only turning that to a god um, is imagine if we draw a picture of the prophet or like let's take Jesus pictures. How many, how, how often it could happen that someone would look alike this person? 
And then when when people, especially in the Middle East or lack of well education and ignorance, when people find someone who looks like their prophet or to their God or whoever they pray for in, in the church or in the masjid, they start following that person. They start worshiping that person. They'll start making a king out of that person. They can make a God out of that person. So, or, or that person can face a backlash if you don't like that religion. So it's just like, it's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things that that downstream impacts that I, I like to encourage people to be mindful of when they think why Islam or why some of the religion recommended of avoiding or refraining from drawing pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And um, this, re the, the, so the, can you say maybe a little bit more about the relationship Islam has with, with Jesus then, since that, that kind of been, that's kind of been brought up, I, you know, and it might be, I just, uh, it's a check. I, for me growing up Catholic, um, I think it's a formidable challenge that Islam presents to anybody who's Christian here. Um, mm -hmm. and as I, you know, as I delved into Buddhism, actually studying this aspect of Islam has actually helped me to let go of some preconceptions of my own around what is divine mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know I, I felt i feel like even though it might be a challenge that we need challenges and i'd love to hear any any insights or perceptions that you or that you've been brought up with around jesus like who is jesus for for muslims um uh yeah anything like that Okay, I'm I'm gonna start with the with the with the basic. Um, believe it or not, Jesus was mentioned in the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam, more than the many times Prophet Muhammad was mentioned. So Jesus was mentioned over twenty three times. I think it's twenty three or twenty five. Um, and Prophet Muhammad was uh, mentioned by name only once. So uh, Jesus was mentioned more than Prophet Muhammad. Both prophets or Jesus was mentioned in the Quran as a prophet and Muhammad was mentioned in the Quran as a prophet. So both are mentioned equally in the Quran and the Quran stated it multiple times that any Muslim should not like have biases um, against prophets. So if you love Muhammad, you should love all prophets equally. So that's a starting from Abraham and all the way down. So that's between um, prophet and Jesus. Uh, the birth of Jesus was also mentioned in the Quran. And when it was, uh, Jesus was mentioned, it was not a, like, it, it was not a spirit of, it, it was not God. It was not a son of God. It was a miracle that God have given to Virgin Mary. Um, and, and, and as simple as that. So that's that's really that when when I'm usually ask it does Muslim celebrate Christmas I'm just gonna say yes we do in, in the Quran but we just observe it differently we don't go shopping we don't buy a tree because if you dig into that that's has nothing to do with Christianity um that actually was invented to um basically basically stimulate the economy um somewhere around the world and that has nothing to do with Christianity uh so anyway yes we do observe Christmas we just don't go shopping we don't most of my Muslims I know, they don't do Christmas tree. I personally do some lights because I love lights. Uh, but again, to the point, the uh, birth of Jesus was mentioned in the Quran. And Muslims were asked, and there is a specific verse, I don't know the exact translation for it, is, is Muslims are asked to have a certain prayer or a say during in the entire day of Christmas, whatever that day it is, is to pray for Jesus and his mom. And it's basically what we're saying is peace be upon you, Jesus, which is very similar to what we say uh, year round about peace upon you, Prophet Muhammad. Um, so it's, it's that the ones that's the say that we have to say during Christmas. And 
for us in some of the extremists in Islam or some of the practicing and Muslims think, oh, it's not necessarily December 26th because the Quran has also mentioned that it was around summertime when Jesus was born. And it's also in the old verse of the Bible. It's born around summertime because there were Mary was asked to eat some dates and we don't have dates in the Middle East around Christmas time. So that's a, the, the birth of Jesus and how we observe it, and how we should observe it. I will tell you that me growing up in a Catholic school with pictures and images of Jesus all around, um, it, I, I used to say Jesus Christ all the time when something good happened or something bad happened. And to me, that meant, oh, God. And when I came to the United States, I used to say it. My parents never made a comment on it because, like, you're basically to them because Jesus is just another prophet. So to them, it's just them like saying, oh, prophet Muhammad, just like it's the same. So my parents never considered this or take it, took it as something that's really offensive to my religion. But when I came here to the United States, especially in Iowa, because I was in Utah first, and that's a different story. Um, when I came to Iowa and I, I say, oh, Jesus Christ, when something bad happened, I noticed that conservative Christian take it as an offense or something that they don't like. And when I digged into deeper, I, I figured that this is something like inappropriate for them. Well, as for me, I'm saying like, oh, my God. So it took me a long time to stop seeing Jesus Christ. Um, and again, it just like... Um, it's, it's something that I grew up with and I, I didn't feel like it's taking any of my Islamic beliefs away uh, because at, at, the, at the end of the day, it's I know what I mean deep down in, inside. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything of your points? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, appreciate that insight, first of all, that Jesus was... Um, well, the holiday of Christmas set up around the economy to stimulate the economy and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Jesus. And the idea that Jesus being born in the summer, based on the idea that they had access to, to dates in the Middle East, which would only be available at that time of year. So, I mean, that's that's just huge. I, I can't imagine celebrating the birth of Jesus in um, in August or July, but that sounds really interesting. <laughs> Um, as a, an aside, I know that um, even the, even uh, some Zen temples celebrate the birth of, of Jesus. They'll get a birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's so interesting to see see that. But um, how about this idea that uh, um, you know in the in the Quran it it talks about not having that God does not have a partner, and um, and so. Whereas the there is this idea that Jesus is a prophet, but he wasn't necessarily equal with God. God doesn't have an equal. Yeah, and, and that will answer one of the questions here about what's the main difference. Um, I, I, I would say it's to your point, the oneness of God. And Islam focused on one statement is la ilaha illallah, which is no God but God. And it's the oneness of God. So there is no son of God. There is no partner. There is no trinity. It's God and God only. And, and if you think about it again, why images are not there specifically of images is the prophet is just to avoid having someone or an equal or a partner or a, a, or a middle person that people start praying towards or to praying for or, or submitting to during their prayers. So the oneness of God is a main and if it's the first pillar of Islam is, um, is the consent that no God but God is basically the oneness of God. So um, again, we look at Jesus as a prophet, just like as prophet Muhammad. It's a miracle per birth. Uh, it's not a soul of God. It's not a son of God. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And this, I also, I'm noticing, and I don't know if this is across the board, but I hear, I hear uh, when I study the, the little bit I know of Islam, I hear this term a lot, the oneness of God. And um, that to me is different from saying that God is one or that there is one God. Um, 
but what I hear often is this this reference to the oneness of God versus there is one God. As okay. opposed to many. Yeah. Okay. So I I love where this is going, and I hope my English as a second language helped me with explaining that. So there is no God but God and the oneness of God. Is the oneness of God is just to pray to one God or 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 God. So does it mean that Muslim God is the only, is, is the right God, is not the only God, is the right God? Th that is the big question mark. And that's because all religions uh, uh, will continue, like we have to find something to argue about. But for me, for me, I will tell you, I see it's one God. For you as a Christian or a Buddhist or for whoever you're praying to, I look at it, it's the same God that you're, it, you're, I am praying to at the end of the day. You call it whatever, call it God, call it Allah, call it whatever. It's the same God because there is no way this universe was created randomly, haphazardly. And in my simple mind, there is no way that this earth was created by different gods because that would be a war of gods right now. Uh, but, so that's why I'm saying it's a oneness of God. It's one God. We're just calling it different names and we're praying towards that God differently. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, what comes to my mind here is that when you say there is one God, then uh, you can only have, you can only say that there's one God if there are multiple gods. But, but if you say the oneness of God, you're talking about something different. It's not about how many gods there are, but that God infiltrates every moment of existence. There's no like separation. You don't go into the mosque and find God and then go out into your car and now you're not with God, right? Mm -hmm. Or go to the workplace and you're not, God's not there, but God's where, you know, when you invoke God or something, God is one. So there's not this separation. Like I go to my family, we're not religious, but sometimes I go to church and I can find God or, you know, things like that. So there's this mm -hmm. unit of the unity of, I would say I, maybe another way to talk about it is that life is one or there there is there is unity and mm -hmm. the human mind creates separation. Yeah. The human mind creates separation. And we call somebody Muslim, we call somebody Christian. That's a separation we're making. Right? Yeah. I like that take on it. Mm. Yeah. All right, so what else? Where where else? The, uh, I yeah. Hear yeah. So, uh, s students, if you all want to share any any questions there, and I'll we can take a look again at these some of these questions. There is nothing as a stupid question. I'm just saying, and I could not be that intimidating. There is no way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, you know, here's a really good question. Um, I think, what is shirk? Why do you have to pray five times a day? What happens if you don't? All right. Okay, so shirk is in a simple definition is is praying or worshiping. Um, we're we're shipping as they say back in the day they called uh we're shipping something that's not god like a, we're shipping a sculpture or we're shipping or believing that there is other god with god like back to the oneness is shirk is believing that there are multiple gods so there is a god for the morning and then there is a god for the afternoon and then there is the happiness god or the sadness god and then you start like defecting and calling different gods so shirk is is basically not believing in the oneness of God, according to my understanding. Why do we have to pray five times a day? I don't have a magic answer for that. My understanding as well, it is tied to the movement of the sun and the movement of the earth around the sun. 
Uh, so that's why there is a, a prayer right before the sunrise. And then throughout the day, each prayer has to do with where is the sun is directed towards the earth. Uh, what happen if you don't pray? Uh, basically, I tell my kids nothing. Like, am I going to say, oh, you don't pray, it, nothing in, in life, as far as they know, nothing. Oh, your pencil broke today because you didn't pray. I'm not that kind of a parent. But yes, there are parents that do that, not me. Um, I don't say, yeah, you had a car accident because you didn't have your prayer. I don't go that route. So what would, would happen if you don't pray your five times a day? Nothing, right? But... The amplification or what the teaching of the Islam is saying is if it, it is considered that this is something in the day of punish and the uh, day of judgment that will be rewarded or punished because it, Islam is really submitting to God and the orders and the requirements of of God, according to the Islam, which if I'm submitting to God, so part of my commitment is the prayer five times a day. Now, if I'm lacking this or if I'm not doing this as intended or not doing it at all, um, this is where in the day of judgment, God will say or will decide that this is something should be like punished, right? According to the Islam. Is God going to do this or no? I, I'm not here to say, oh, this person didn't pray. He's going to go to hell. Again, that's I'm not here to judge anyone. This is up to God. But I personally... Like for me, the prayer is more of a meditation. It's more of like, I'm putting everything aside. It's time to do my wash. It's time to connect with God. It's time to stay away from my teenagers. That drives me nuts. Um, and it's time to stay away from my work and just connect with God. I feel like it, it brings me back to my core. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, when you say it's time for your wash, can you clarify that a little bit? Uh, so prior to um, each prayer, are required to do a basic wash. It's not like something that's complicated. We start by washing our hands, then washing our face, uh, rinsing our mouth, blowing our nose, uh, washing our elbows and our feet. And the whole point, again, is... Again, it's spiritually, it's preparing you. It's really preparing you to be clean to me, God, or to connect with God. And I, when I'm doing my wash, I feel like even if I'm like frustrated, it calms me down. Um, it feels like I'm refreshed. I rinse my mouth. I'm right. Like I'm really connecting with, with God. And think about it when, when you have a date or, or something with someone, you just put your best clothes on, you shower, you smell good. You're not going to go junky and trashy with all my respect. So it's the same thing. It's like washing and freshening up and be in a representable manner to meet God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So kind of like uh, in, in purifying your external appearance, you're purifying, you're preparing yourself to meet God. In a yeah. Sense. Yeah. And, and, it, and it also, you know, I think some, some of us might have this background, like if you don't pray or if you don't go to church, you're going to go to hell. But that kind of idea, I think you just, as far as your experience goes in, as a practicing Muslim, it's not like, if you miss one of the, I mean, it seems like, a, I think for a lot of people who may be used to going to church once a, once a week, praying five times a day might seem like a, like, a, like an overkill or, uh, you know, it seems, might be like, wow, if you, and you got to do that. And so this idea of, uh, of having to follow something exactly, right? And if you don't follow it exactly, you're going to go to hell or, uh, but that's not been your that's not been your experience or that's not how you see it necessarily this is not how i see it it's five times a day a hard i will tell you hearing my kids and how many times they complain and frustrate about it i feel their pain to leave the xbox and go wash and i get it i really get it i've been there <laughs> i've been there done that uh, but um i i my son, I'm not sure if I shared this story before. My son, two years ago, he was 12. He challenged me, and even his brother did the same. And um, he challenged me on the concept of the prayers. And my oldest did that before him when he was nine, and he's now almost 18. He said, okay, 
I'm done with your religion. I'm not going to pray five times a, a day. Josh, his best friend, goes to church once a week or Sunday or Wednesday, and that's enough. I'm just going to go with him. And I'm with Ed. <laughs> best of the coolest thing that I could do because I really don't care I said like you know fine you know fine I don't care if you want to go to church go to church uh, if you want to be a uh, uh, Jewish I'm also fine as long as you're connected as long as you're praying uh -huh. so I said how about uh it was a Sunday how about on Wednesday we're gonna go to church we're gonna have an observation and then we're gonna go from there so we went to church and he figured out it's a really a commitment it's just like a four hours thing right so he came back home <laughs> and next week i was like when he came back home i was just like i'm not gonna go there um next week on sunday I was like, Omar, let's go church time sunday and he's like um no no i'm gonna do my five years um because to him it doesn't take more than two minutes the three minutes maximum with the wash with the prayer he doesn't have to wear something like dress up he can pray with his pajamas on he does not leave for his room he can pray anywhere around the house it's just like like for him he started realizing oh it was not as complicated as four hours of a sunday and friday uh wednesday commitment wow wow that no that brings up two questions for me one is um about how old do you did you start requiring if that's the best word to use i don't know but asking your children to begin that that uh ceremonial uh or that practicing that one pillar of islam salat when what age did they actually because i have a four-year-old son and and um we we say prayers at the at meal times and he sees mom and dad doing our our ceremonial things but we don't we don't uh require him to do anything but it would be nice to be able to say hey this is what we do and I'm just wondering when the, the first the question is, when does that start for you and or for for children? And then the second thing is there. It sounded like there was a shift that took place for you where, you know, you said you'd been there and done that with the resistance to praying five times a day. And, and for example, your child has to leave their Xbox and then, you know, take two minutes out and do that. And it sounded like there was a shift for you somewhere in there. And maybe you could say a little bit about that. I mean, it, 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 I'm guessing it's different for you now than when you were a kid. Yeah, of course. Um, and that's a great question. So when should we start? I, I don't have a magic answer, but I will tell you that kids follow what they see. Mm -hmm. we, we heard that like kids will repeat words that their parents say and sometimes i see my behavior in my kids so it starts as early as day one kids listen hear observe and they just follow the path so if the parents are praying you will find and i've seen it so many times when i used to pray i would see my son it just he was like a toddler just mm. right by me trying to do the same thing and we all get happy and take pictures right oh, uh, but then what happens then and, and i look back and it's like what happened why it's so hard he grew up doing that and this is when the parents it's recommended it was just a recommendation by the prophet it just is, is as early as they could but then by age of seven you start talking to them about it and then just pulling them into it now it is required uh according to the religion is by the time of puberty then they are required and this is when what some scholars refer it god's clock starts is this is when your deeds will be counted on you when you hit puberty um, sometimes this is like the time you're you're becoming an adult um so for me where is the shift i'm i'm just like my kids right we all get busy right as a teenager trust me i used to think that i'm always right my parents don't know anything so i've been there done that when my parents asked me to do my prayers i'm just like oh my god i'm gonna leave my tv show and my friend there was no internet at the time so i'm just like gonna leave my tv show and go do this i'm too lazy it's easier to be on the couch right it's, it's just like we're human being right so i've been there i've been there and i've challenged my parents why should i go like like I can literally crucify just like my friends and just call it a day, right? Um, 
So I've been there, done that, and it took me time to like understand a little bit more about the religion, understand more about the Islam, and then find my soul in it. And once you start filing your soul in it, then it doesn't become a burden on you. Mm -hmm. It's not like something I can keep teaching my kids or pouring it into them or forcing them into them. It, once the connection hits with them, once they start practicing it, like you can go to yoga and practicing the um, the movements and it doesn't click with you because you're not bringing yourself into your core, mm. right? Some people are not like really successful in yoga because they cannot bring their organs and themselves into the meditation uh, mindset and then to bring themselves into the core and prayer is so much like yoga you can be there and just do the movements and I tell you like a lot of people I know they say we don't feel anything we just go there and do the movements um, but for me it just once I bring my mindset into it once I, I wash I do my pre-prayer prayer or just the saying that I say before I start my prayer to start bringing my mind into it and I start focusing on what I'm saying and I feel that's really my connection with God then I don't need a reminder to do it I, I don't feel it's a burden for me because sometimes I feel like it's my getaway yeah. I'm, I'm not get away from the stressful daily life so what I hear is that a lot of it has to do with your your mindset your attitude in going into it and and um, yeah, as our minds mature, as we become more adult, enter more into adulthood, perhaps we can more easily connect. I'm guessing still though, even as an adult, like there's times of resistance to doing that where you know, like, you're so busy with stuff. And you're like, oh, I'll get us, I, this, it'll be four times today, not five. <laughs> or something. Exactly. Honestly, it does happen. I'm not saying it's yeah. the right thing to do. Uh, do right. I want to? do i want them to do them timely absolutely can okay. i do it all day consistently no yeah so so then uh then in that case there's the that's where maybe would you say i would what i see is there is like humility arises like we're not perfect we we recognize some degree we know what perfect is or we we have some idea of what what we should be doing but we know we fall short yeah, we do. And this is where comes another concept of, of Islam is the jihad. Jihad means struggling the self. It's not the jihad that you hear about on Fox News, trust me. It's not bombing building. It's not, I don't know where this one came from. Um, the jihad, the word jihad in Islam means, or in Arabic means self-struggle or basically struggle. And this is where you know, when I, oh my God, I had a long day. Now I have one more prayer. I'm just going to leave my bed, go sh like rinse and do that wash. It's really cold. And can I, that, and you know, that's the struggle. That's the jihad. This is where it comes like, I need to be bigger than myself and my emotional, like my physical need at this point and think about my emotional need, right? So this is where, Sometimes I know it's hard, but this it comes with the rewards as well. And, and that's something for, according to the teaching of Islam or any religion, as far as I know, is that's when, when, when you try, when you struggle to do your best, when you try to avoid temptation, this is the bigger the reward is. And, you know, the, the, also the, the beauty I see in, in prayer five times a day is the fact that they the prayers are happening at specific times and so that even if you're by yourself you're still doing it with the whole community yeah I mean, that's that's something really like that just blows my mind because usually like for christians at least my experience growing up catholic i could say a prayer but it's my personal prayer to god and there may be my mother's doing it with me or something um but there's nobody else there's nobody else in the room there's nobody else in the society that they, they, it's it's random whether people are doing it or not at that time but with islam it's not random it's like these are the these are the times you do it and everybody's doing it together. i mean to the best of their ability everybody you know there's at least probably a hundred people doing it at the same time as you yeah uh, yeah it's a beauty it's it's 
it unites people. Well, think about it. When it's done in community or in groups, it unites people. It gives them a chance to connect. And at home, and I will tell you, it's when it's prayer time at home, I like to call on my kids. It was just like, okay, something that we can do as a family together. Like the conversations we have around the coffee table, the dinner table, it's the board game night, or it's something to bring the kids together, right? And, and connect. Um, and, and in so many religions, there is a say that says family that prays together stays together, right? And after we finish the prayer, everyone is usually in a better mood. So if there was a little bit of tension or arguments about who's taking the car today or the allowance, usually things are calmer. Um, so I, I, I think that's uh, one point about it. Another point about it is, is the first word in the call for the prayer is Allahu Akbar. In trans specific, the translation for it is Allah is great or the greatest in some other translations, which means no matter what you're doing right now, Allah is bigger, greater. So just leave what you're doing, go take a break, go back to God, connect, and then come to back. And I think it's just another thing that some, it might make some people humble. So no matter what you're feeling in that moment, that this is the biggest thing in your life. My job is the biggest thing in my life. This is, this is it. Or, um, or this promotion is the biggest thing of my life. Or this person I'm sitting with is, I'm just my crush or whatever. So it's like, no, hold on, take a step back. It's not what you're thinking right now. Allah is the greatest. Take a break, go do your connection, do your prayer, and then come back to whatever you were doing. Hmm. Hmm. Man, and, and it just feels like so many of us, all of us need to be reminded of that constantly. Not necessarily, I mean, we could put different words on Allah la Akbar. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. <laughs> Allah, Allah Akbar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We can, I, I mean, but I, what, what you're, to me, what you're saying is that there's something more important than whatever activity is we're doing at this moment, right? World <laughs> religions, there's something more important than studying a world religion, <laughs> <laughs> right? There's something bigger. There's something more important than uh, going to college and getting good grades or getting a job. There's something more important than that. Uh, yeah. Those things are important, not to not to belittle it, but there's something even more important than that. And we forget. We, we continue mm -hmm. to forget that. And so to get a five time a day reminder, I mean, that sounds like that feels that seems like really uh, uh, important just for mental health let alone yeah. spiritual health. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other the other pillar of uh, Islam being uh, Ramadan, I, I know there's five, but the Ramadan also strikes me in the same way as Salat, where it's not just it's not just uh, the time zone you're in, but the entire Muslim community is getting together. This is how many billions of people at the same time doing the same practice wherever they are in the world? That mm -hmm. just kind of blows my mind. That just and for a whole month. Yep, and I think you can see that in so many different things in Islam, whether it's the prayer, with the Ramadan, whether it's the Hajj or the pilgrimage, it's the same. Islam is all about unity. Um, we talked about the prayer and how it unites people together. And if uh, also you think about it, there is a, I just came back from Egypt, it's completely different time zone, right? Different countries around the world, it's all different time zones. So if you think about it to your earlier point, there are like hundreds of millions, if not millions of people are praying 24 seven and just around the clock. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's on the prayers to Ramadan, to your point. So fasting in Ramadan is another pillar, is a pillar of Islam. And fasting is not a new concept to Islam. Um, there is an article I wrote a year and a half ago in the Greater Des Moines Partnership about fasting in, in Islam and fasting during the months of Holy Ramadan. So why Ramadan? Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. It is the month that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad. And we fast from sunrise to sunset. Basically, we're refraining from food, water, and physical interaction or intercourse. Uh, but that's not like whole point here. It's not the whole point is to starve you. Yeah. 
um, the whole point is to be physically and mentally connected to God. And there is a lot of scientific medical research, and this is not me, this is not Islam, that's proven the connection between healthy body, healthy minds, when we refrain from food and water for more than eight hours specifically, and if, even if we took that further for 30 days. And there's a lot of women that can attest that intermittent fasting works well for them to sustain a healthy um in a healthy body. There is men too that do that system. Uh, there is fasting in Christianity. I grew up Catholic, so Lent is a big thing for me as well. Um, so fasting in so many different religion and fasting was also mentioned in, 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 in the Bible. So fasting is, is, is one, the, the whole point is again to connect with God, to remember that because no one would know that you're fasting or not, except you and your God. So I can be fasting in front of you, but I just went to the bathroom. I had a sip of water, right? So that's that's the the the, the fasting is for you and in God to know, and as no one else has anything to do with it. Um, sometimes you might pray in front of people, right? And people will know that you're praying, but fasting is the only thing that. If you're doing it, you're mainly doing it for God and it's not really to show off or anything of that nature. Um, another thing I would say during the month of Ramadan, it's recommended that we pay our charities. Uh, it's recommended that we go we do good, uh, say good, uh, because if you're fasting and you're cussing at your brother or your coworkers, uh, your fasting would not count. Um, so fasting is really refraining from any bad deeds, not only food and water and intercourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I got a, a message here from Pabitra. She says, uh, so the Ramadan is not the word which means fasting. Instead, it is a, uh, a one of the month. Okay. Yes, Ramadan doesn't mean fasting. Ramadan is the name of the month. Fasting in Arabic means som, S-O-U-M. S-O-U-M. So, so, uh, S-O-U-M. That, ah, okay. Thank you. That, you know, that's <laughs> the point that I was not clear on. Uh, uh, yes, but Pavitra says, got it. Thank you. I wasn't clear on that either. So, som. so Ramadan does not mean fasting. It's the name of the month. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. Okay. That's really, really helpful. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see there. Uh, there's so many good questions here. Is there any questions in here that the students asked that I shared with you that you want to respond to at this time? Mm, let me see. And feel free, those students that are out there, please uh, feel free to chat in like Pavitra just did. Really I'm going to talk, talk about the stereotypes about women in Islam. Mm -hmm. Is it justified? Yes, justified. I don't blame anyone who has any misperception about women in Islam. Because I'm going to say, yes, there are countries and governments that impose and enforce by force and law that women dress in a certain way. Is that Islamically? No. Has that anything to do with Islam? The answer is no. So I'm just going to say what's happening in Iran or Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan or Pakistan, that women should dress in a certain way when they go out of their home. Is that Islamically? The straight answer is no. But if there is a stereotype that this is some people's perception about Islam, I don't blame them because actually there is truth to it. It's there in some countries. But the, your role is here to understand and dig deeper to understand what the religion says about the um, Muslim women. So Islam is the, according to my understanding, is the only religion that allows the women to inherit from her dad and her mom. So that was not there in any of the other previous religion that precedes Islam. Um, in Islam, women were teachers, women led, uh, led forces, led countries, and believe it or not, some Muslim countries has a president women, and that did not happen here in the U.S. yet. Uh, so there is nothing in Islam that restricts women from anything, not to be educated, not to be as equal as men, not to um, 
not not to inherit money, not to work, none of that. Uh, not even to work. When people say, oh, I'm a Muslim woman, she's not working. I will tell you the, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, wife, Hadija, was a merchant. She was a business woman. She was a very strong businesswoman that was well known more than him when she married him. Uh, so that would tell you that no, uh, uh, like there are men that out there that would not be intimidated by women's success or Muslim men, do they have to uh, oppress women. That's, that's not the case. That's not in the teaching of Islam. That's not in the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad. It's culture, it's government, it's traditions, um, it's closed-minded that people did things certain way and continue to do it because it um, basically serve their agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of you bringing up the point of, of Khadija being this powerful woman in the life of the prophet and even well, you know, before he, he became, even before he became known as the prophet, she was there and out, outshine him in a, set, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that was yep. part of that culture at that time. But we can see the connection between uh, or maybe some of the differences between when a culture or a nation imposes certain things on women versus what does Islam actually say? Yeah. And they're, they're not always the same. And we confuse those two things. Yeah. And uh, on that concept of also Muslim women, oh, a man would have four wives. I'm just going to tackle this one because it usually like people shy away from bringing it up. So does Islam allow for a man to be married to a former woman? Yes. The simple answer, yes. Is it fair if you dig into the structure and requirements and the criteria that Islam put for the men or for the man to go this route? It's really tightened criteria with a lot of circumstances. And the first condition is the approval of the what the other wife or the first wife so if you keep adding you have to have the approval so if that condition is not given it's not given then this marriage is not legitimate or not allowed according to the religion however that's not the case and men or some men have misused that again they have taken the statement don't look at the criteria and don't look at the rest of the verse and they said oh they've given me four wives i'm gonna go for, go for wives but look at the rest it says the approval you need the approval you need uh, to be very just and equal which means if you got a flower here you have to get other flower here and um, means if you spend a penny here you have to spend another penny here even with your feelings and with your emotions you have to be just uh so some men don't follow that they just take what they fit them what fits their agenda and they do it and then they give bad representation about their religion but that's not necessarily the case mm -hmm. so um moving into uh, yeah moving into um, what's happening in, uh, politically right now around Afghanistan. It seems like it's a big thing in the news right now. Um, and, the, and the idea of the Taliban, I, I'm just curious your perspective on what you're hearing from the news. Like I, I you know, we hear about the, the women in, in uh, Afghanistan now getting all of these rights removed after the United States has kind of pulled out. And there seems to be this connection that people are, I think people are making this connection that the United States has come in there, they instilled all of these Western values and equality for men and women. And now they're pulling out now that the Taliban has taken over, women are losing rights. That's kind of the image that is being projected right now. And um, I'm just wondering your perspective on this and, and you know, anything you want to offer there? Whatever I would say it's really politically complicated. And I will tell you, my 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 shyness thought about it, not as a Muslim, just as a as a citizen of the United States and, and just knowing the region a little bit that, that much. I'll tell you. It's all political. It's all a power game. Mm -hmm. 
has nothing to do like yeah is women rights and how much freedom women have gained over the years is at stake right now is at risk yes but is it really that's why it's happening no i just want the people to think about what's really important is power um who's in power who's in control and who wants to be in control right so with that my understanding is with the eviction of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan, as was agreed and planned for so long, I've made Taliban to decide to go back and take power of that. What what is the big question is what it means for Taliban to take over, and part of it is going to be women rights, of course. But for Taliban to take over is is it is it going to create uh, more of um, extremist mindset, just this is how it's going to be, most likely, yes, because they have known to just, uh, I would say, politicalize the religion, if that's a word. Um, like in Egypt, a Muslim Brotherhood uh, have tried to take uh, power and actually won the election a few years ago. Um, if you ask me, I am a Muslim, am I going to support Muslim Brotherhoods? Muslim Brotherhood, I will tell you now, not because I'm a Muslim, I'm going to support them. I personally believe if they want to serve in government, they should keep the religion outside of it, the name of the religion outside of it. So if they do something good, it's on them. It doesn't reflect negatively on the religion. If they do something good, it's on them. It does not reflect positively on the religion. Um, so this is how I feel about any institution or any entity that uses the name of religion in governing uh, or overpowering people. Keep the religion outside of it. Call politics, politics, call government, government, and keep the religion out of it. Don't say I'm enforcing this law because of that religion. And, and that's the concept here in the United States, right? We try to separate the church and the state, but in real life, this is now what's happening because until today you have some states that can't a, a portion is allowed and some other states that it's not and it, when it's not it's basically religion based while in real life that's not separation of a church and a state mm. yeah yeah so um how do you understand so separation and church of state um how do we understand the oneness of god when church and state are separate where, how do you, is there a way to reframe that so that it makes sense more like, like doing that? I will tell you, it's, it's a very fine line. I'll tell you what, the state should give the people the freedom to do whatever they want to do. So the state should give the people the freedom in my simple mind for a portion. Now, now I'm a Shaima, I'm a Muslim. I know abortion is not allowed in my religion. And there is like very, very, very fine line of when it could be allowed, when the woman's life is at risk, when the child's life is at risk. So there is like when within the first six weeks, there is like a lot of, again, conditions and criteria that has to be met for abortion to be allowed. But that's the oneness of God when it comes, right? This is what got to me. This is why my connection is follow the words of God. But what the state is required to do or what the government is required to do is to give the people the option, right? to do whatever they want to do. If they are Muslim, if they are Christian, practicing Muslim, practicing, not every Christian is believing that abortion is not allowed or is something that against God's will. Some Christian would look at it differently. Mm -hmm. So government should make decisions that's away from using any religious based facts or uh, requirements. That's in my simple mind. No, I mean, I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I like the way you say that. Uh, and the fact that actually here in the United States, we say on paper, the separation of church and state, but the reality, it depends. Not every, not every state is actually doing that. And the example you just gave around abortion is, uh, is, a, is a really good one where there, we're interjecting religion into, into law. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And it in gay rights, right? That's something that frustrates a lot of Muslims when I talk about it. I would say you're in the United States of America and there is a separation of church and state. So marriage is a civil 
right? And marriage is not a religious unless you and your partner decided to practice a certain religion and practice it together, right? And commit this religion and this family to that religion that you're following or to God. So that's up to you. It has nothing to do with the government. has nothing to do with the country, with the law that's in here. But marriage, in my mind, is civil unity, right? Or a united um, agreement. And as should be offered to whoever, any two people that wants to get married, this is what the government is required to do. Now, what the people decide to do, that's up to them, right? So if two men decided to get married, absolutely, that's their decision. It is something that me, I believe in, in, in that. No, I, in, in the three religions, as far as I know, this is a sin. Am I here to judge them on this sin? The answer is no. Am I here to go tell them what they are doing? This is wrong. The answer is no. But I am here to ensure that they have their basic human rights to be treated as any other two people that are seeking marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love that. That, um, and and that's a, actually that's a, feels like a really strong foundation to stand on the the separation of church of church and state or religion and, and politics. Uh, when we're looking at, at at some of these laws that have been obviously influenced by religion. Um, it feels like a really strong ground to stand on when we look at it through the eyes of separation of church and state. Um, and then, so which one are we going to follow, right? Yeah, which and, one? Yeah, which one? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm seeing we're, we're coming down the time here. Uh, I just want to make sure we get all of our questions answered. Uh, we didn't, I, we, we did some of the ones that you guys share asked us, and I want to open it up for you all to um, maybe one or one or two more questions here. Feel free to chat in or just to unmute yourself. I feel like most of the questions that um, that you all asked or were answered here. Um, so maybe we're maybe maybe this is a good place to to quit on a strong note here. I really I'm really again, I'm just like I'm feeling some strength here <laughs> from this conversation. And that's always a good thing. You know, sometimes conversations you get into, they pull energy out of you. But this one has been a very uh, the opposite has happened and given me energy. So that's good. Oh, there is. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's um uh, let's 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 stop there. We'll end there for today. And um, again, I just really really appreciate you coming in to share and and I and I do recognize that you're you're one voice of how many billion Muslims of uh, how many billion Muslims are there? Oh, I'd say we're 2. Point something. I could be wrong on data. <laughs> how many? What was it? 2 2.8 last 2. time I Okay, 2.8. So almost three billion Muslims. That's, uh, but still, it's um, it it's helpful. It's helpful for me, and I think it's helpful for us, or for our class, to kind of um, see that there's not this stereotype Muslim. There's not this stereotype Muslim woman. That um, you have your own voice, and I really appreciate you sharing sharing what you what you, you from your own experience. I can't do that. I'm not a not only am I not a scholar of Muslim, I'm not a practicing practicing Muslim, so I can't give that. And uh, so it's just really priceless for us to to hear directly from you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for having. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, folks, uh, and that will uh, conclude us for today, and. Um, yeah, so I'll stick around for a little bit if you guys have any any question about it. keep in mind the upcoming assignments. Um, I don't have them right in front of me, but um, check your course calendar. Uh, I know that you have a, a project on Islamophobia that will be due next. I believe don't don't uh, quote me on these dates. I really want you to look at the calendar because then I'll, I'll say a date and then you guys forget or you guys um, take me take me literally and and um, and then meanwhile I've already I've already planned it for a different date than what I said. So check the calendar, just to say, check the calendar. I sometimes make mistakes on these things uh, to see what's up and uh, make sure you do those things and ask any questions. Now's a good time to ask questions or if you have something later on. Um,